Pastor Ojinga, Lady Ojinga, and all the saints of God, name by name, one by one, for your testimonies, for your prayers, and for your presence. Um, I know Lady FY just finished praying. We also, uh, we acknowledge the young people, amen? But before I do anything, uh, I like to pray as well. So just bow your heads in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to preach. It's preaching time. Father God, I ask that you put me in the background, put your son Jesus in the foreground, help us to find common ground, and through the aid of the Holy Spirit, take us to high ground. Speak to me, speak through me, speak with me, and speak for me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 As FY had stated, we have our nieces and nephews over, and it was nice to see uh, them active. Uh, that's how churches continue, right? Young people continue because they see what the elders, I don't know if I'm an elder, but what, oh, FY's an elder, but <laughs> what the older ones are doing. So we, we thank God that the lineage is passed down from parents and aunties and uncles and older cousins. And then the little ones come with Tahir, Elijah, Israel, Cammie, uh, uh, Diana, are all allowed a chance to partake in the worship. Because if we're going to continue, they are the ones. Somewhere I've read, I think in the book of Proverbs, train up a child in which they should go. And when they get older, they will not depart. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. And I just want to thank all of you out there. We got my mother, aunts, cousins, uh, sister-in-law, dear sisters in Christ. And the beautiful thing about a church is that it's not about biological bloodlines, but we are united by the blood blood of the lamb and i'm mm -hmm. talking about jesus christ so mm -hmm. that makes us all family mm -hmm. so how you doing with family amen mm -hmm. amen not gonna prolong the time i know that's something that we can never get back time is one thing i've learned you can't get back so we're going to jump right into it the message for today is entitled vision and the valley of decision in a house of division I'll say that again. The title for today is Vision in the Valley of Decision while we're in a house of division. Amen. And it's coming from Matthew chapter 12, verses 25 through 26. Let me just say this. As you turn to it, um, I'm, I'm reading those two verses because it ties in to what I want to discuss, but I want to be transparent. To contextualize, I'll give you a quick backdrop before we get into the verses. Jesus had just performed one of his incredible spiritual miracles, and it was manifested in front of the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day. And they didn't respect Jesus, nor did they respect his authority as the son of God or God in flesh. So they made a, a, a little snide comment. They said, mm, he's able to cast out demons because he be my, I'm paraphrasing, he must be a demon himself. And then our Lord came back with this statement. This is a battle that started on the spiritual realm, all right? This also ties in into the electoral process, all right? He said, well, what do you mean by that? Well, let's get into it. First, let's take a walk down memory lane, if you will. Let's go to the scriptures. First of all, voting is something that's not really mentioned in the Bible one way or the other. So this is not a sermon against voting, and this is not a sermon for voting. It's just breaking down certain concepts from the Most High. For example, the children of Israel were commissioned in Deuteronomy chapter 1, 
verse 13 to pick leaders, right? And this is the first uh, recorded example from scriptures of how you should choose leaders. And this is what it said. Choose for your tribes wise, understanding, and experienced men, and I will appoint them as your heads. So even though they call it voting right. or election, this is a process that started in the word of God. Are we supposed to choose leaders for yourself on this realm? Amen. To take care of certain things. Voting in the United States. Now, my dear brothers and sisters in, in England, Auntie Cheryl, uh, I know we got some brothers and sisters in Guyana. This may not apply to you for a Tuesday, but the ramifications will affect everyone. And they said, well, why do you say that? Well, not to be conceited, but as we know, according to the Western world, quote unquote, that the American leader becomes, quote unquote, considered the leader of the free world. And there's an old expression, Pastor Quasi knows about this, they said, if America catches a cold, the rest of the world catches the flu. He said, well, what do you mean by that? Well, what we mean is that the way our international resources, our relationship is so intertwined that if something happens to the United States, United States of America, it impacts the global community. So this is something that is interesting and hopefully with the help of the most high we can dig into it so voting in this country originally belonged to a specific group of people specifically white men who were over 21 and were land owners i'll say that again voting wasn't for everybody at one point it was for white men over 21 who owned land. When George Washington was elected president in 1789, only 6% of the population actually voted. In 1856, there was a new law passed where it allowed all white men the right to vote. In 1870, the 15th Amendment gave black men the right to vote, not women. However, certain states put certain things in place to prevent black men from exercising that right. So what do you mean? Well, they had something known as black codes. So black man goes down, want to exercise his right to vote. He's now considered a citizen thanks to the 13th and 14th Amendment. He go down to the poll, and they say, boy, read this. And even though he might be 60 years old, that's how they treated him. They called him a boy. And they say, read this, boy. Now, they know most slaves weren't allowed to read. It was illegal to teach them how to read. So the black man, he looked. He can't, unless he was sneaking how to read, couldn't read. And so they said, well, Go about your business. You can't, can't vote here. If he could read, then they would say something like this. But that's going to cost you $10 to vote. They call that a poll tax. I'm just saying $10, for example. I don't, I don't know how much it really costs. Black man go in his pocket, just came out of slavery, hardly getting wages because he's using wages to feed his family. He said, well, I, I don't have the money to, to pay. So, well, guess you can't vote. But let's say the black man could read, have money to pay the tax. Then they would say, well, boy, let me ask you a question. Was your granddaddy a slave? And he go, and his head is shame. Yes, sir. But then you can't vote. And they called that the grandfather clause. And then they would dismiss him. Now, let's say, by some chance, the black man had money, could read, granddaddy wasn't a slave, 
and tried to vote, then he would be intimidated by mobs at the poll, by the Ku Klux Klan, and they would try to intimidate him. And this lasted for a long time, a long time, a long time, and a long time. In 1920, in this country, women finally got the right to, to vote. Women only been voted this country for 100 years. 1961, the 23rd Amendment gave citizens of Washington, D.C. a chance to vote. But check this out. The crazy thing was that if you could, you could vote in a presidential election, but brothers and sisters in Washington, D.C., which is predominantly black, they couldn't elect anyone to the House of Representatives. Now, that doesn't make sense. Our nation's capital doesn't have any representatives. So this tells you the game of technology that was used to prevent certain people the right to vote. And not just black people. White men, as you can see, poor white people couldn't vote. Women couldn't vote. Black men couldn't vote. And finally, in 1965, under President Lyndon B. Johnson, he was able to pass something known as the Voting Rights Act. Now you said, well, wait, why did you tell us this history lesson? Well, one, it's interesting to me as a former social studies teacher. I love looking at history and, and understanding where it fits. But I also understand the rationale why certain people, I'm talking about black people and women, get very, and men, why we get passionate about the right to vote. Because we know it was something that was denied to our forefathers. We know that two Jews and a black, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman were killed because they tried to get us the right to vote. We know that Dr. King led marches to get us the right to vote. We know that Malcolm X gave a speech in 1964, which I listened to, and I was like, man, it's the same thing going on, called the ballot or the bullet, because we understand that voting is important. And I don't not vote it. I believe you should exercise your duty. It's your civic responsibility. However, I don't not brothers and sisters who choose not to vote. He said, wait a minute. You sound like a politician preacher. You're telling some of us we should vote, and then you say we don't have to vote. Well, because the truth is you have the spirit of liberty. We're not worried about this, or we just pass it by. But Jesus did tell his disciples when they were talking about taxes, he said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and what is God unto God. So therefore, that was talking about paying taxes. But anything that falls under civic responsibility, municipal duties, brothers and sisters, it is your duty to do it if you can. But if you choose not to be a part of the system, I understand, and we could talk about that right now. So while we're in the valley of decision, we have to ask that God activates our godly vision because we're in a particular situation. We are in a house of division. I'll say that again. While we're in the valley of decision, we have to pray to the Most High God to activate our godly vision because we are in a house of division. What do I mean by that? Well, brothers and sisters, we can tell that this nation is ripping at the seams. Never before in the history of this nation, and this nation is technically 444 years old. Its birthday was 4th of July, 1776. But unfortunately, since she was born and birth, she's been nothing but trouble. He said, well, what do you mean by that? Oh, we love America, no doubt. We love America. I love the United States of America. In the United States of America, a man or a woman can reinvent themselves. You can get a business in the United States of America. You can come from another country and do better for yourself. You can be in this country and rise up to certain living uh, conditions that you might not have started off with. So I know very well the beauty of America. Ray Charles, a beautiful, talented brother, even sung a song that no other American could sing when he said, oh, beautiful, or oh, spacious skies, or oh, land of amber waves, or oh, purple mount of majesty across the distance wave. And that brother couldn't even see, yet he knew the beauty of America. So there's no denying the beauty of the United States of America. I, I would be a fool to deny the greatness of this country. But unfortunately, 
as a black man in this country, I've seen the ugly side of America. I know this country was built on genocide, stole the land from the indigenous people. I know this land was built on murder when it took and kidnapped brothers from Africa and sisters from Africa to come help build this country. I know this country was built on classism. If you couldn't own land, they didn't give you the right to vote. I know this country was built on the backs of racism when immigrants started coming from China and Ireland and Italy, and they said, no, you go sit over there. You're an immigrant, you're less than. I know the ugly side of America. I know about four little girls being bombed in 1963 in the church on Sunday school in November just because their parents wanted the right to vote. Man shut down in the back Mega Evans in front of his wife and children. I know about the countless men and women in jail, not because they did anything wrong, but they was in the wrong place, wrong time, didn't have a good lawyer. So I understand. I understand that the God that we serve is a beautiful, loving God, but also know that he's a God of justice. Amen. And after a while, that justice will be served. So now when you look at the house of division for the first time in a long time since the 1800s with Abraham Lincoln, this country seems to be at a seams, and it seems to be at a crossroads. And I'm not going to get too much into the candidates, but it's what Jesus said. He said, no one their thoughts, every kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. There's division in the land. There's people that's pro-life, and there's people that's pro-choice. There's a thing called red states, and there's a state thing called blue states. You got those who uh, want the traditional way of white supremacy. Then you got those who are trying to get globalism with a new world order. You got homosexuals fighting for their rights. You got blacks saying black lives matter. You got Antifa saying we don't need any type of government. You got the old white supremacist saying, no, we need to maintain control because if we give it to y'all, y'all know what you're doing. The nation is in a state of confusion. And when you say Satan is against Satan, you say, oh, brother, don't say that, Minister Bagugan. That's not nice. Are you saying Donald Trump and Joseph Biden are Satan? No, I'm not saying that they're devils. What I am saying, though, you got to look at the word, what is a Satan? A Satan in the Hebrew was considered to be an adversary, somebody that was an adversarial force. And what I mean by that is that when you have two adversaries, you got to look at who are they against. The fact of the matter is you got two men who don't necessarily always equip with the word of God. You got one man who said, I'm not going to dare repeat what he said about other nations. He said a derogatory term. He said, man, I wish they wouldn't come over here. You had some man saying, well, you know, even though this nation is a nation of immigrants, that's what this country is, a nation of immigrants. All of them came from some place or another, except for the indigenous aboriginal people. But the person said, I don't want the immigrants here. They got another man who said a lot of things, got a crime bill to throw people in jail, and his vice president did the same. Then you got another man who, who says the most outrageous things, come across arrogant. Satan is against himself. That's adversarial. When you say little codes about groups that are white supremacy, you tell them, stand back and stand by. And we all know those are codes. Then you got another man, and they arguing and saying, well, who's more racist? No, you're more racist. No, you're more racist. It sounded like my son and one of his cousins having an argument. And I wanted to put both of those gentlemen on the timeout. This is the type of leadership we're dealing with. This is not mature leadership. This is a sad state of affairs because these men, are well into their three score and 10. And this is the type of leadership we have. Now, is that making fun of them? No, brothers and sisters. I would never disrespect the office and our leaders. We're not to make fun, but we got to understand what is going on. This nation, this government, and this people will not be attacked in places that they built, per se, but they will be destroyed from within. He said, what do you mean? Why are you saying that? We see it right now. We got arguments. Um, it's, it, back in the day, I used to, I've been voted since 1994. You go, you watch the debates, even if though they might not like each other, they shook hands, they came across civil, and, you know, just say, hey, it's not personal. This is just politics. We're just running for office. But this has really got people divided. And I want us as Christians not to get too caught up in that. 
This world is not our home. Yes, if you want to vote, vote. Yes, you feel passionate, but don't get to the point where you're arguing with your brothers and sisters. I know for a fact people who have said they're not going to talk to anybody if they vote for one candidate or the other. I know people saying, if you don't even vote, don't even consider me family. This is the mindset. This is the spirit of division that's carrying on. The sad thing, beloved, is that governments all over the world will ultimately fail because that is the design of the Most High God. You see, God is a jealous God. Look at Exodus 25. He said, don't make these idols and these leaders. You should not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, is a jealous God. So you know what a jealous nature does. A jealous person has to show you all the faults of the person you fell in love with or the things that you like, right? Got to show you. I was watching Michael Jordan's The Last Dance, and, and he was triggered by certain comments that the owner would say. He said, that person is a better player to you. Michael Jordan said, oh, you think he's a better player? I'll show you that he's not. And he would go out there and make a fool of the person. Well, the Most High God is doing the same thing to leaders. Some of us put so much trust in leaders. God's exposed and saying, this is who you want. This is, this is, you want them over me? And let me just show you what's going on. So he's showing us what's going on because we have to realize that we can't expect the ungodly to do things in a God-like manner. At the end of the day, these are just human beings. That doesn't mean you shouldn't vote. That doesn't mean you, if you want to campaign, do what God put on your heart. I would never tell you not to do that. Don't, don't be like that. But I don't want you to get so passionate when you forget that even after the election, as my dear mother-in-law said this morning, God is still on the throne. Don't get so depressed. I remember 2016, coming to work the next day, brothers and sisters were crying. I'm talking about grown people. Children were crying. I thought somebody had passed away. I said, what happened? I said, Trump got elected. <laughs> I said, huh, what? Trump got elected? Okay, what they got to do with us? We're going to keep on living. We're going to keep on eating. We're going to keep on thriving. He said, we, we, you believe that? Sure. Trump or Biden. Because I know the God that we serve is unimpeachable. The God that we serve will pour out the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. The God we serve is not elected or selected because he is the ultimate authority. And he's got the whole world in his hand. This house is crumbling. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a lot of people try to disrespect what that man did, and I don't disrespect anything that my elders do. I, even if I don't agree with an elder, it's never, I try to, I learned this from my mother and father, I never disrespect an elder. I may not agree with everything they do, but at the end of the day, I realized that they paved the way for me. They've done things that I have yet to do. So I always show respect, even though I might not agree, might put my head down, might not always agree with what elders are doing, but at the end of the day, you have to respect your elders. So I feel what Dr. King and those people did, I don't like when I hear young people say, oh, they were silly, and that's not nice. That's not, that's not of God. Or they foolish because they, no, no, they were doing what they thought was right at the time. And thank God that they did. Wouldn't be able to get certain things. We'd still be in the back of the bus. So never disrespect your elders. That go for famous elders or not famous elders. Always show respect to your elders. Always, because they are the ones who built that bridge to, for you to get across. So it'd be very disrespectful. But there's something that Dr. King said that was very telling. Once he fought for integration, he said, I have a funny feeling that I've integrated my people into a burning building. This is what Dr. King said after years of fighting for civil rights. He said, I feel like I might have integrated my people into a burning building. Now, check this out. No offense to Dr. King, but that isn't anything new. John the Revealer told us the same thing. He said, come out of her, my people. Once he got that warning on the Isle of Patmos from the, the great Messiah, Jesus Christ, he said, come out of her. He was talking about mystery Babylon. He said, come out of that, that, that mindset. Come out of that fearing about their government. Come out of them trying to pull your emotional heartstrings, got you all worried about what will happen if this one gets elected or that one gets elected. Come out of her. But the beautiful thing is that John the Revealer, the Revelator, wasn't the first one to say that. That is something that God told a young man during his time, a young man by the name of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, if you turn with me to Jeremiah 41, 45, 
it gives us something that Jeremiah went through. And I prayed when I was going over the sermon, the Most High revealed this to me. He said, go turn to Jeremiah 41, 45. And I said 41, 45. Sorry, brother and sister. Jeremiah 51, 45. And we ain't going to tally. We just want to, if you read it, it'll take a note. We're coming from Jeremiah 51, 45. And this is what the Most High God had Jeremiah say. Let me give you the backdrop. Babylon, which was once the mightiest nation in the world at one point, all right? And now it's modern day Iraq, all right? So when America was fighting against Iraq back in the day, Saddam Hussein, he said, I ain't worried about America. He said, America's a baby compared to me. Because he knew his history. He knew that that land, that region was ancient Babylon. And we ain't going to talk about why they were over there. Because they, they, they said it was there for weapons of mass destruction. I'm going to tell you what they were fighting for. People were like, there was no weapons of mass destruction. Oh, yes, it was. There were portals that they wanted to get control of. But we ain't going to go there. That's another place, another time, another topic. But that battle, because ancient Babylon was a place of power. But the Most High God had finally came to deal with Babylon. Babylon was arrogant. Babylon had idolatry. Babylon oppressed people. Babylon was not praising the Most High. Had a leader named King Nebuchadnezzar. Had built this big tower for himself. Sounds like somebody we know. Very egotistical. huh? And before it was over, God had to humble Nebuchadnezzar. Right? Had him crawl in and turn into a beast. With another topic, another day. But in any event, God had to humble Nebuchadnezzar. Had to humble Babylon. But now he's talking to this young man, Jeremiah, and he gives him this prophecy, and this is what it said. Go out of the midst of her, my people. Let everyone save his life from the fierce anger of the Lord. Come out of her. I remember when I was a little boy, I'm not going to say which sister, one of my dear sisters loving the life, but I remember one used to, when she would get a spanking from my beautiful mother on the line, she would call for me and say, Stevie, come and help me. And I said, yes, sis. And I said, Ma, I try to reason with my mother. Don't and don't go ahead of her. You, this is a new era. You need to talk. She said, boy, if you don't move, I'm going to hit you too. I said, yes, ma'am. I got out the way. I got out the way, beloved. I'm not a fool. <laughs> and so the same thing with us. We need to pray. Listen, pray for America because America is do a spanking. Now, let's just call it like it is. The whole world is due for a spanking, not just America. But he said, well, why are you picking on America? Because America has become the leader of the world. And there's a fight. There's some who are trying to say, let's keep Christian values in place. There's some who say, let's keep America, I ain't talking about keep America great. great. No, no, no. Keep, let's keep America righteous. I'm talking about men and women of God. And the leaders themselves are just puppets in this whole thing. We got to pray for them because they're the human beings. We don't know what they're going through. We could go by what they're saying. Hello? But the most high judges by what you do and what you say. I'm not God. I'm not their judge. So we ain't endorsing anyone today, brothers and sisters. But I will say this. Come out of her. What do you mean by that? Come out of that mindset of worrying about who's going to win the election. Come out of that mindset of letting them educate your children. Come out of that mindset where we're watching their television day in and day out. It's okay to get a little entertainment. But don't let them put everything in here because it becomes a fair machine. It teaches people certain lifestyles are acceptable. Don't let them have us overeating. I'm talking about myself right now. That's the beauty of America. All you can eat, you are, yes, Lord. And you're doing it to your st structure, to yourself. I'm talking about myself right here. I ain't talking about nobody. But this is what he also said in 56 and 57. For a destroyer has come upon her, and still in her mighty voice, their waves roar like many waters. The noise of their voices raise. Her warriors are taken. Her bowels are broken in pieces. I will make drunk her officials and her wise men, her governors, her commanders, and her warriors. They shall sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake, declares the king whose name is the Lord of hosts. Now, we're coming to the end, but check this out. That's what's going on. For the first time in American history, we got leaders who, for lack of a better word, sounded like they're drunk. You got leaders who are appearing to be sleepy. I'm not saying names. Y'all know who we're talking about. Y'all not going to get me in trouble today. But we ain't afraid of anybody. We trust in God. But use your mind. You know who I'm talking about. If this ain't the, if the word of God, this is the truth, brothers and sisters. It tells you right here because there's nothing new under the sun. 
So just like Babylon had leaders where they were confounded, they were wise and powerful, now they're appearing that they're drunk, just saying all types of craziness, doing all types of madness, doctors saying, stay in, and they're going out, waving people. Got one guy talking, looked like he want to take a nap, but he wants to be the leader of the free world. This is the leadership that we're dealing with. Not to attack, but this is something we need to open our eyes to. Don't get so passionate about them. If anything, pray harder for them, because this is what we have. This is our choices. If you're in the desert and somebody said, brother, do you want Pepsi or Coke? You want to say, man, hey, all I got is Pepsi or Coke. Where's the water? <laughs> But thanks be to God, we got a decision. We have the liberal water, the most high God. Jesus is saying, vote for me. Jesus is saying, I won't let you down. And yeah, you're going to have to make a selection. I understand. If you're thirsty, sure, you have to make a selection. If you want certain things passed, I get it. I get it. I, I, I totally get it. Voting is good, but it can't reverse judgment of the most high God. Political parties are good. But they can't exalt the nation because somewhere I read righteousness can only exalt the nation. They ain't got nothing to do with a Democrat or a Republican or even a third party. We should pray and respect our leaders, no doubt about it. But we shouldn't put our sovereign trust in these leaders. Psalms 146 tells us, don't put your trust in princes because there's no salvation. But put your hope in God who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is there. God will execute justice for the oppressed. He will give liberty to those that's in prison, and he will set the captives free. Brothers and sisters, I love you so much. As we go about our day, whatever you're doing, that both some of us already made your decision. Don't let no one make you feel bad about that decision. If you voted, you did the right thing because you listened to what God told you to do. Some of you say, I'm not voting this year. I'm abstaining. I don't want to choose any evil. I don't want Tyler to us to choose the lesser two evil. And beloved, you did the right thing too. Don't feel guilty about it. Some of you still on the fence. You don't know what you're going to do Tuesday. But I hope this is giving you some confidence because whatever you do, when you go in the booth, make sure that before you go into the voting booth, you go into your prayer booth. Say, God, give me a decision. I don't know what to do. This seems like this is a house of division. And what you got to do is give the Lord thanks. Lord, thank you for giving me another chance to be alive. Thank you for keeping me in my right mind. Thank you, the coronavirus is here, Father God, but you kept me from seeing and unseen danger. Thank you, Lord. And because this is what happens, when you think about the goodness of the Most High God, you begin to thank God. When I think, I think. I think about how God kept me. I've been people pulled knives on me. He kept me. We grew up in a rough neighborhood in Eastern York. Guns all over our heads. We lived next door to a crack house. God kept me. Police brutality all in the neighborhood. I lost friends who died. God kept me. I had the coronavirus take two of my dear friends' lives. God kept me. So when I think, I think, I have an attitude of gratitude. Amen. That's what we need to do. I'm going to leave you with this verse, brothers and sisters. That's very nice what you wrote, Israel. We got young Israel right here. God bless you. It's going to be one of the ministers, one of the deacons. These are, we got future deacons here. He's right here. He's writing love on the paper, and I'm preaching. Amen? Go ahead, brother. This is what it says in the word of God. Come on, sit. Come on, sit. This is what it says. Second Chronicles 714. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. I'm not going to leave you on the doom or gloom, because we know that there's hope. No matter how it goes, we got hope. No matter what they say the outcome is going to be, whoever God allows to be, it's going to be. Amen. Do the best you can. Give God, as Pastor Jigga likes to say, give God the best of your life for the rest of your life. God bless you. Keep the faith. Walk good. God bless you. I love you very much. But God loves amen. you so much more. Amen. 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 What a strong, amen. powerful time. I hope you've been blessed by this experience. If you want to enjoy more of our works, more of our messages, feel free to hit subscribe. Join us and be blessed.